As many of you know, I love to read. I love books. I read voraciously. And I'm blessed to have chosen a profession where it's expected and encouraged that I will find the time for study and research. And I like that that study and research includes reading lots of books. I read broadly. Poetry, theology and religion, cultural studies, history, biography, criticism, psychology, and beyond. But I also read a lot of fiction. Literary fiction, experimental fiction, short fiction, science fiction, young adult fiction, and on and on, you name it. And it is probably fiction that I enjoy the most, though I'm a little uneasy saying that. It feels like having to choose a favorite child. My topic this morning is about reading fiction as a spiritual practice. And I want to say just a few things about this topic before I go any further. I've never preached on reading fiction as a spiritual practice. I've tried in the past preaching on novels, and that's not gone well. I spend the whole time trying to give a synopsis and trying to constrain this beautiful, wide, broad thing into something narrow, and that always feels like I'm not doing it well. I'm also aware that people often face judgment for what they read, as well as for what they watch or view or listen to or what forms of art they choose to experience. This is true across all art forms, but it may be particularly true when it comes to the types of books people read. I've asked people, what are you reading? And they've, they've answered almost apologizing for reading something that they are enjoying in that moment. So please know this sermon is not about judgment. It's not about prescription either. This is not about you should, or you ought to, or you're a bad person if you do not. I don't preach those types of sermons, at least not often. <laughs> Please also know that I am not going to end the sermon by giving you a reading list. It is not my goal to try to convert you into reading the things that I read. And also, I'm not going to ask you to give me a reading list either. I actually have in my office, literally, a shelf of books that have been given to me by parishioners, hoping that I will read them. The bookshelf is full. <laughs> I'll let you know when it's not. <laughs> so I think of it this way. Two weeks ago, we had this guest preacher, wonderful guest preacher, who talked to us about her practice of observing a Sabbath. And I listened carefully. Her message was not, thou shalt. It was not, this is something you must do. It was more, here is what I needed, here was the benefit, and here is how I did it. And this sermon I offer in an equally invitational tone. We engage in spiritual practices in order to connect ourselves with some greater truth that we might otherwise overlook or forget. And we engage in spiritual practices to make a change in ourselves and in our living. It might be to become more grateful, to become less anxious, to become more aware, to become kinder or more patient or less judgmental, or, or, or. And when I say that reading fiction is a spiritual practice, I'm saying both of these things. That first, it connects us with a great and cosmic truth, and that it produces a change within us. In the same way that science has studied the effects of some forms of Buddhist meditation, science has also studied the effects of reading fiction. How many of you knew that, that there have been experiments on what reading fiction does to the brain? Well, a story in the Washington Post from a few years ago with the eye-catching headline, Does Reading Fiction Make You a Better Person? reviewed a number of those recent experiments that claim to show that reading fiction makes a small but significant change in how our brain functions. And I'm just going to give you a sampling of those studies. In 2006, researcher Keith Oatley 
published his findings that linked reading fiction to better performance on empathy tests and on social acumen tests. Which is to say, this study challenged the idea of the reader, the bookworm, as some kind of nerdy social misfit, quite the opposite. His research claimed to show that fiction readers tend to have improved social skills. Another researcher found using an MRI machine that when people process stories, that it lights up the part of the brain used for inferring thoughts and feelings in others. Reading fiction seems to exercise the parts of our brain that are responsible for empathy. In 2013, a group of researchers published a study, a study that linked reading literary fiction to an ability known as, in psychology as theory of mind, which seems to involve being able to imagine what another person may be thinking. And in 2014, this one is really interesting, researchers did a study in which one group read a passage from a novel about a Muslim American woman, while another group read a synopsis of that passage that contained all the same information. These researchers found that those who read the section of the novel, quote, were less likely to make broad assumptions based on race than those who had just read a synopsis and received the facts, suggesting that the way a story is told is as important, if not more important, than what is being said. Powerful stories change us in ways facts may not be able to. Researcher Keith Oatley concludes, when we read about other people, we can imagine ourselves into their position, and we can imagine it's like being that person. That enables us better to understand people better and to better cooperate with them. Who else finds these psychological experiments interesting? I think, I think they're really interesting. And on the one hand, I find them fascinating. On the other hand, I find myself asking critical questions. I'll get to those in a second. I realize I couldn't preach this sermon without actually talking about some novels. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit, just briefly, about the last four novels I've read that I consider to have a profound effect on me. I'm going to do two sentences on each, so don't worry. <laughs> as soon as it was published in July, I immediately devoured the newest novel by Pulitzer Prize winner Colson Whitehead. The Nickel Boys tells the story of a friendship between two boys who are locked away at a horrific reform school in Florida and traces <clears throat> their life trajectory. Octavia Butler's dystopian science fiction novel, The Parable of the Sower, which I read the previous month, tells the story of a band of survivors led by a teenage prophet who are trying to simultaneously stay alive as well as salvage their humanity. The Parade, the newest novel by Dave Eggers, which I read in the spring, is a long parable in the form of a short novel. And it tells the story of a duo of American contractors as they build a road in a third world country. It contrasts their approaches, which are as different as night and day, to cross-cultural experience, at the same time as it ponders the meaning of globalization. And finally, the last perfect novel that I read was the debut book by Daniel Gumbiner called The Boat Builder. The Boat Builder tells the story of a young man battling an, opiate, an opioid addiction in Northern California. In the words of one review, it is the story of resilience, community, and what it takes to win back your soul. So those are four books, four works of fiction, and as I thought back to kind of the last four great novels that I read, I began to think of those experiments. And I began to wonder if it's possible, if it's possible to conclude that reading fiction or literary fiction produces more of a change than popular fiction, if it's possible to 
conclude that reading fiction produces more of a change on those empathy scales as nonfiction, wouldn't it be possible, perhaps, to like subject those four books to analysis in the laboratory, and one could actually score which one is more efficacious on us? Let me see if I can explain what I mean there. What if we all, what if we had the research money in the world and decided to measure the benefits of specific authors or specific books? And, and what if the data showed that Octavia Butler produced more measurable results than Colson Whitehead, or vice versa, that Hemingway is superior to Faulkner, or vice versa, that Margaret Atwood edges out Toni Morrison? I'm beginning to get a little facetious here, or science fiction. But what if we could measure the spiritual impacts of hymns? What if we had data that showed that spirit of life was more efficacious as a hymn than Blue Boat Home? Or that Sweet Freedom is more efficacious as a song than Honda Chant? Or that the Rolling Stones help our brain more than the Beatles? <laughs> See, this is making us, this is, this, is, this is silliness, of course. And there's huge amounts of subjectivity. But as much as I smile at the results of those experience, experiments showing a modest benefit to reading fiction, I don't read fiction for the brain benefits. I would still read fiction even if a study came out showing that crossword puzzles were better for my brain. What I'm saying is that we can't reduce, shouldn't reduce, art or creativity or religion or spiritual practice to just the ends, to a simple question of what are the results. We read or sing or pray or sit in silence because our spirits cry out for us to do those things and because there is a wholeness that we find in the experience. I'm inspired by the writings of Marilyn Robinson, whose project I interpret as deeply humanistic, as a deeply humanistic refusal to accept ways of thinking that diminish and reduce our humanity. All this came up in a writing class, Robinson writes, when I asked the students to describe their assumptions about human motivation, it became clear that a number of them took for granted that the substratum of all behavior was self-interest, this understood as gratification of certain of those same uncountenanced impulses that Freud had in mind. Now my students are excellent, large-spirited people, really exemplary. There is no reason to suppose that either reflection or experience would have led them to suppose, uh, would have led them to such a dark view of their own kind. But this notion of human nature was taught to them as true and good students that they are. They have accepted it as true. And this has had a significant negative consequence for their fiction. Robinson is a Christian, and as such, she takes very seriously the teaching that we are made in the image of God. And if we have a simplistic, mechanical, diminished view of our own humanity, we would then perhaps be implying a simplistic, diminished, constrained idea of the divine. For the past week, I have been stewing over the ending of the last novel I read, which in many ways was not fine literature, where the protagonist, the protagonist in the arc of his story, is offered two different resolutions this arc of his character, and there's two different ways in which he can reach resolution. And as I was reading it, I was thinking ahead, I know which one he should choose. And I was rooting for him to choose one and not the other. And then the novel ends with him choosing neither. He rejects the binary which is kind of fitting because the protagonist in this book is transgender. In an interview with the author, the author asks the interviewer, so by the end of the novel, how did you read him? And the interviewer answers, 
I guess it is just more complicated. I guess it is just more complicated. It's a theological idea, and it is also, I believe, what I'm reminded of when I engage in the spiritual practice of reading fiction. For me, the spiritual benefit of reading fiction is the reminder that it is more complicated, that people are complicated, and that there is an inherent mystery that is part of our humanity, just as there is a mystery in the idea of God. At Flyleaf Books here in town, there's a wonderful sign in the shop window. A bookstore is bigger than the world, for the world only contains things that exist. What I'm getting at here is this sense of grandeur, largeness, limitlessness, and mystery. Marilyn Robinson puts it this way. I read, read recently, she writes, that there are more neurons in the human brain than there are stars in the Milky Way. And I have read any number of times that the human brain is the most complex object known to exist in the universe, and that the mind though not identical with the brain, is more mysterious still. Reading fiction, as the research shows, may increase our empathy or improve our abilities at the psychological skill of thought of mind. It may positively influence our social acumen and can even make us more tolerant, accepting, and inclusive people. And all of that is wonderful. But there is another thing that fiction does as well. It reminds us that the world is immensely large and vast, is complex and mysterious, that it resists our attempts to reduce it to something somehow lesser. Being reminded of this mystery through the imagination of innumerable lives and loves and dreams is important, for it may result in us having a bit more curiosity as we engage the mystery of one another. So may you find ways, may you find ways to ever be reminded of the mystery. And may that reminder allow us to engage the mystery of one another in better and more holy ways. Amen. Blessed be. And let us join in singing our closing hymn for the morning, number 1008, when our heart is in a holy place. Oh,